Hi everyone, thanks for joining this afternoon's webinar. This is Sharon Byron, Marketing Manager at TrueCode, and I want to thank you all for joining. I am thrilled to present um, today's webinar presenters, um, Amy Char and Tom Squalamati. Uh, they are both from one of our partners, Records One. Amy is a Vice President of Optimization and Analytics Services. Um, she has a wealth of experience working in various roles in HIM and revenue cycle, um, most recently working for a large IDN and they're um, helping with seven acute care campuses um, and that before she joined Records One. And uh, Tom is a Senior Director of Analytics Services at Records One and also has a broad uh, range of experience in HIM and revenue cycle as well. Um, so we are thrilled that they're able to join us today um, for our presentation. Before I hand it over to both of them, I just want to review a couple of housekeeping items um, for today's webinar. First, everybody is in listen-only mode, so that means if you have a question, you can um, direct it to us through your control panel, and there's a little questions section towards the bottom, so feel free to type questions uh, that way, we'll hold them all till the end and then we'll answer your questions at the end, but feel free to submit a question at any time. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, we will review how to obtain your CEU, but basically we will be sending out an email to everybody who registered today and that email will come out tomorrow morning. It will have a link to the recording of this webinar. It will also have a link to a brief evaluation. So once you submit that evaluation, you'll be able to download your CEU certificate. And if you have any problems or um, you run into any issues, feel free to send me an email and you can do that by just replying to any of your true code emails. Um, and I will make sure I help you get your certificate. So I think um, that's all the housekeeping. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of just kick things off. We may jump around a little bit topic-wise. Um, Tom and I are a little less formal, and so we really want this to be sort of more like a coffee talk with Tom and Amy um, and, and really have it hopefully we'll ask some thought-provoking questions or maybe have you – consider things in a different way than you have in the past. Um, we really wanted to focus on data and different ways to use data, whether it's coding, CDI, audit, um, or other areas of HIM. So to start off, I think most of us are hopefully familiar with the HIM Reimagined campaign from AHIMA. And that campaign really started to raise awareness of the importance of HIM professionals to expand their roles beyond CDI, coding, and, and medical records. And many of the emerging roles really focused on the importance of data. And so, like I said, today we want to be able to discuss some of the use cases that leverage data and technology to improve operations and outcomes. Okay, um, so some of you may be fortunate enough to work in environments where clinical validation is happening in an automated fashion. As codes are assigned or queries are issued, that information is compared with the clinical information and alerts or second level reviews and other processes are initiated without human intervention. However, what happens when these processes happen the old fashioned way? So before we dive into clinical validation specifically, I wanted to diverge for a moment and talk about consistency. So much like there's variation among practitioners and sometimes there's difficulty in reaching a consensus definition for a particular condition amongst the medical staff, there's also variation amongst coding, CDI, and audit teams, whether that be a small facility or a large healthcare enterprise. So when we talk about coding data, one of the key concepts that I want that I was introduced to came from my work with our NLP engineer, so natural language processing. Um, when hospitals implement CAC, there's a lot of discussion about precision, recall, and how accurate the computer is 
But one of the first questions that my engineer wants answered is what is the coder interreliability for a particular client site? And I, that was the first time I had really heard it discussed. And so I was like, what is coder interreliability? And so it's the concept that if you have five coders, 10 coders, 100 coders, um, that all code the exact same chart, how often do they agree with one another about the exact codes that would be placed on that chart? So if your coder interreliability is only 50%, which is what we've seen at, at most sites. It's between 50 to 65%. Um, how can you expect a computer to agree with all of your coders more than that? So uh, it's an interesting concept because a lot of us have worked with CAC or worked with it for a long time. And I, I think really examining your own internal coder interreliability is, is kind of a new concept. Um, I think a key piece of clinical validation is consistency. And to be successful, you want to make sure your coding and your queries are consistent as well. So it got me thinking about audits and if auditing by random sample is really the best way to measure coding quality. And if maybe we should also factor in a consistency measure where the same five or 10 charts are provided to each coder, or if you work for an auditing firm, each auditor, or each CDI specialist, um, to ensure that the coding that the, that's resulted from all the different auditors, or all the different coders, or the queries in the case of CDI specialists doing a review, um, to ensure that all of the outcomes are consistent among the team. If the physician's documentation is aligned, right, around a consensus definition when we're talking about clinical validation, we also have to be sure that the interpretation and recording of that documentation is also aligned. So I, I just wanted, before we dive into clinical validation, I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's something that we need to think about. Um, you know, if we're, if we're set to say that this is, you know, facility X's definition of acute respiratory failure, and all of the medical staff have agreed that this is our consensus definition, and these are the clinical indicators that clinically validate that condition. It's really important that everyone else that's reading that information is going to interpret and code or query the same way. So Tom, um, did you have anything that you wanted to, to add before I talk a little bit more about clinical validation? Yeah. I yeah, thanks, Amy. I think it's it's a hard thing to achieve, and I think that our conversion to IC10 and the addition of all the 70,000 plus codes in both diagnoses and PCS makes it a little more difficult, and that's uh, something that we're we're, we're going to have to uh, deal with going forward. How to how to make that into reliability better? All right. So um, one of the things. You know, obviously, we've highlighted that the AHIMA um, practice brief update in 2019, I think, clarified that there is indeed a coder's role in clinical validation. And, um, you know, for, for coding CDI and clinical validation, coding has, has a role. Um, I think a lot of us have tried to or ex had experience with the institutional definition and policy. Um, and I, I think it I think it holds true. We want to make sure that when we're looking at you know best practice and we're looking at those consensus definitions, that we're also that we are aligned operationally, interdepartmentally across the enterprise. So if the physicians have a consensus definition, that definition is interpreted and coded you know, in a consensus manner, in a consistent manner, it's queried for in a consistent manner. And really all of those things should sort of tie back to one another. If you have clinical indicators that define a condition, those are the clinical indicators that should be on your query templates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just really wanting to make sure that, again, your clinical validation brings up an interesting point because like we said, in some cases, systems have technology that's automatically behind the scenes. If a coder codes sepsis, it's automatically looking at the record 
saying this patient doesn't meet sepsis three condition, their SOFA score isn't there and is routing it somewhere else for second level review. But a lot of times that's not happening. And so we use denials data and other clinical data and we're actually having to query the EMR system to go back and kind of retrospectively clinically validate. Um, you can kind of go to the, the next slide, Sharon. So, Tom, um, it's use case for single CC kind of roadmap. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I thought we'd get started by uh, looking at the CMS inpatient prospective payment system proposed rule, which I'm sure we've all kind of digested now, knowing that we're looking at some severity changes in CCs and MCCs that a bit of a surprise for fiscal year 2020. I think there were over 1,400 code changes as far as severity. So in, in kind of uh, reading through the proposed rule, it struck me that, uh, you know, we should, we should have a way of making sure we understand our CCs and our MCCs down to the level that we need to, the level of detail, and specifically single CCs and single MCCs. So as, as a uh, simple use case, I think, it's a good idea to uh, make sure that in our data, we're able to count on every single encounter, just how many CCs are on the case, and that's from zero to a single CC to two or more CCs, and really come up with a, a, a true roadmap or a grid so that we can tell just how many cases had a single CC, how many of those same codes were involved with other CCs, and then match those to the actual MSDRGs, both of the uh, pairs and the triplets, or as we say, you know, triads and dyads, so that you're, you're getting to the actual cases in your historical data. And then we know that we have the, uh, from CMS, we have the grouper list of CCs. And, and again, this has to come after your case has been grouped, because uh, remember, we've got all those principal diagnosis exclusions. Uh, but basically, you're going to end up with a, a large, uh, spreadsheet of all your CCs, not just your top five, but everything. And, and there we can then start to sort and create metrics that work for us. And for me, I want to see the difference between uh, single CC percentages versus multiple CCs so that I know that, for example, uh, hemiplegia would be something that probably 80 to 85 percent of the time it going to be a single CC, and now we know in this proposed rule some of these CCs are going to go away next year. So uh, I need to know right now what those differences look like, and if we go to the, the proposed rule, uh, and you, you're familiar with uh, the tables in, uh, from the CMS site, we've got table 7A and 7B where we can look at the MSDRGs and see the differences between version 36 and the version 37 groupers. That's at the DRG level, that's fine. But starting in October, I want to know what all these new uh, CCs look like and what all the non-CCs look like that we expected. So for example, if I look at historical version 36 data, probably one of your top CCs is acute blood loss anemia, right? And it may have a single CC rate of being 50% or thereabouts. And that's going away next year. So, you know, we still want to capture that information for administrative purposes, but it's no longer a CC. And then just some examples here, major depressive disorder, paralytic ileus. You know, as you look down this list, you're going to have all of it instead of just saying, well, I want to look at my top five MCCs or CCs. And if we flip to the next slide, uh, same process with major CCs. And, and again, here, uh, my count is one. I just want cases with a single MCC. And again, I'm going to match those to those uh, triplets and pairs. And remember, we've got the MSDRG pairs that are CC slash MCC. So in this case, getting a single CC means I, I don't have to worry about a uh, single MCC means I don't have to worry about a CC. So again, we, we go through this process and you can make up your own metrics, if you will. Uh, but it's going to give you an idea that going forward in 2020, where we have some MCCs that are now CCs, you know, what am I leaving out on? What does it look like? If I look at ESRD, for example, it's going to make up a lot of uh, change 
to what we're currently using in version 36. So again, my point is uh, don't be afraid to look at all your data, match it to the tables that we get from both CMS and we use uh, from the, the grouper that's posted by CMS online, and then you can start to see where, where you're, you're going to target some of your uh, education and look at things that maybe we didn't think too much about this year because we're so used to doing it the same way. And uh, I would okay. Just add a uh, slide I, six. Go ahead, Minnie. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, like on the major depressive disorder. So again, it's about using data, right, in a way that you you may not have. So instead of, um, you know, pulling ten cases with major depressive disorder as a single CC, is there a way to look at all of them and compare to the medication list from the host system? So it was pretty easy when you're looking at hundreds of thousands or mi even millions of encounters when we're talking about large healthcare enterprises. Um, if you pull every single case where major depressive disorder was a single CC and then compare that with the medication list, um, again, you can start to zero in. And this is where we talked about clinical validation may not be happening automatically but you can use data to help you narrow down which cases need to be clinically validated that at first blush don't appear to be clinically valid. So um, it's important to look at, have a CC roadmap, have an MCC roadmap, but again, you can tie it back to clinical validation as well, um, utilizing data because payers and CMS have yeah. access to medication reports and they have access to the claims that are coded. So if you are concerned about single CCs or single MCCs being taken away and where you need to focus those education efforts, you've got to mine the data. Right. And then just to piggyback on that, Amy, uh, as far as drugs and medications, uh, again, we can use some of the tools that are available like uh, RxNav, RxNorm out on the Internet, where they actually uh, – take a list of drugs and move them into classes so that you can look for depression classes and not have to go out and search for all the, the current drugs that are associated with uh, major depressive disorder. So use those tools and, and they'll help you, I think, make that clinical validation easier. Uh, next slide, uh, next use case uh, is one that I think uh, from auditing some of us are familiar with and that's uh, Principal diagnosis sequencing, you know, something as simple as let, let's just collapse all of our PDX to three characters, principal diagnosis, and then let's do the same for our first secondary diagnosis because sometimes because of the way our, our groupers work, uh, the sequencing decisions we make for around the uh, definition of co-equal diagnosis means that we have a pneumonia versus a respiratory failure or a COPD versus a pneumonia. And the question becomes, what do those look like? And, and why do we have differences sometimes that seem to be split 50-50 and other times, you know, 80-20? Uh, so, again, simple process. We, we know the codes. We've got the data. You can uh, collapse it down to those three character levels, look at a probe sample, and, and then go ahead and look for uh, those anomalies, and it's just something that, uh, you know, if I go to a coding clinic from first quarter 2019, again, we're looking at the question of dehydration versus AKI or AKI versus dehydration. So where do you stand? And, and does it make sense that I look at some of these because we're following a path that is consistent with our historical data or maybe we're not quite there? Amy? Yeah, I would agree. I think this is an interesting scenario that Tom poses, and you can really do it with any co-equal diagnosis, is look at your historical data and look at, and hopefully the answer is not, it depends on who coded it, right? And so where it's dehydration versus AKI or AKI versus dehydration or any of those where there's some co-equal and, you know, coding clinic supports that they they are co-equal and you can assign whichever one. Start comparing that with the treatment that was provided so that you can start to sort of, again, create a path. So when you're audited, you can say, we coded it this way because we've determined that when this is the treatment plan 
this is the principal diagnosis versus when this is the treatment plan, we choose this other pathway, right? How are you guys really looking at co-equal as a system? So again, leveraging that coding data, but also layering in other data points to really support, again, consistent application of your facility or, you know, company guidelines. Okay, good point. Um, next slide. Uh, our next use case here is uh, looking at a mid-type and uh, some secondary diagnoses. And I'll just preface this by saying that for several of these uh, examples, what I like to do is uh, look beyond our day-to-day -day world of revenue cycle and see what's being published in the medical and health journals consistent with uh, clinicians who want to look at a certain problem or hypothesis and they want to use our coded data to do that. And you'd be surprised at just how, how often that comes up as, as a way to not have to read through an EHR and look for a certain data. Uh, so here we've got uh, an example of uh, an elective uh, uh, surgery repair here, elective vascular aneurysm repair or, or an EMR. There were some implications in coding and accuracies for EVARs. And one of the things I noticed right away was that uh, there are guidelines for patients going to have their AAA. We're not going to bring you to surgery if you've got decompensated CHF. And so, you know, as you look at, you know, right now, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I've got an elective admission. I've got an MCC of heart failure. That, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and, and really, I want to go back and look at that documentation, make sure, especially if it's a single MCC, which oftentimes it is. Uh, and just, you can go from there. For example, in our F fiscal year 2020 uh, tabular right now, there are over 700 codes that have the word acute in the title. Okay, and we know the ones that are specific to some of our elective cases or some of our non-elective urgent and emergent cases, but do you really understand what's happening in your elective population? So we can use some of those data points from our uh, uniform bill, and in this case, you know, admit type to say, write, write that query. I want to see those cases and feel certain that the documentation is going to make it as far as... Uh, you know, the, the uh, payer side. So take a look at, at opportunities like this. And, and just so you know, for your handouts on these PDFs, the uh, blue outline in the images, these are links. So you can go ahead and click on these articles. And again, it, some of them are, are fairly complex in terms of the clinical aspect, but just pay attention to the coding piece and how that might relate to what you're doing in your day-to-day -day work and you might be able to walk away with some information that you haven't really thought about a lot, like, gee, those patients don't go to surgery or that key heart failure. So where, where, where are we missing in our documentation and how does that relate to our coding and uh, CDI uh, transactions? Amy? So just, I think, again, if you have technology, whether it's through your EMR or whether it's through your, you know, just data mining with Excel spreadsheets, Tom's done it kind of both ways. But like he mentioned, set up something where you've got an elective surgical admission and there's an acute secondary diagnosis that you're using to drive up that, that DRG. Because if we can find it, right? Just by looking at data and data mining, payers can obviously find it. And so um, you just, again, we, we extend beyond just reading Coding Clinic, the Journal of Ahima, the Actus Journal. Um, there's, you know, a lot of these are all publicly available articles that are published in, you know, the Journal of Vascular Surgery or the AMA, you know, JAMA. Um, and it's important to keep on top of these things because these may not be top of mind. But like Tom said, he was able to see that if a patient has decompensated heart failure, um, it's contraindicated for their AAA repair. 
So when you see something like that in a medical journal, you go, okay, that should automatically be sparking questions. I wonder how many elective AAA repairs I have at my site with decompensated heart failure as a secondary diagnosis, because that could be a red flag. Maybe it's not a huge problem for you, but maybe it is. And at a lot of, in a lot of the data that Tom and I have looked at, we're seeing things that are coming up in, in these use cases. We're finding and identifying issues um, in client data. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, next slide, next use case. Uh, this is uh, this is a, a, a relevant one, type 2 MI. Uh, I remember a few years ago, the uh, Coordination and Maintenance Committee provided us with code I-21A. Of myocardial infarction, and as a lot of us know, that uh, type 2 MI is controversial. We understand that some cardiologists and uh, internists get it; others are shy away from it. Uh, the, the two articles that I have on this particular slide, I think, are important because they're recent and they tell us that uh, definition of type 2 MI and then using it appropriately. So the first article talks about uh, a troponin study on patients with ischemic stroke and that type 2 MI is significantly uh, are associated with stroke severity, discharge, disposition, and mortality. Now, this struck me as interesting because uh, I remember reading about type 2 MIs thinking that they're typically related to uh, arrhythmias and anemias and that sort of thing, and I never thought of strokes as being something that would catch my eye as far as looking for troponin and understanding the history and documentation that should uh, be associated with a type 2 MI. So just recently, uh, if you took a look at your fiscal year 2020 agenda, uh, they did add the code first notation under type 2 MI. Originally, they left it as it could be a principal diagnosis. Uh, I didn't really agree with that, and I'm glad they, they made that switch because we have the caused by something. And in this first article, the neurologists are claiming that it is a hemorrhagic stroke. So again, take a look at that. Keep that in mind that it's not always as straightforward as what's listed in the code first. Uh, the second article, also very interesting and also relevant based on the second quarter coding clinic, comes from JAMA Cardiology talking about uh, misclassification of myocardial injury as myocardial infarction. Okay, so again, in the clarification of the fourth definition, they're saying that injury is not necessarily a type 2 MI because you have an elevated uh, troponin. And, and, and that's important, and that's why a lot of us were hoping that we would get a uh, code for myocardial in injury, and there was a uh, question in the most recent coding clinic that says we'll use code I-5189 for what they call non-traumatic myocardial injury. Now, I'm not sure why they decided to add non-traumatic in front of that. I mean, we don't say non-traumatic AKI, but anyway, at any rate, there is a code now for myocardial, myocardial injury. So going down the road, we're going to want to take a look, and you can bet that your third-party payers are looking at your type 2 MIs to make sure we've got the right information that uh, identifies myocardial injury from type 2 MI, that it matches up with what's documented in the record, and importantly, that we have the correct codes for it. So, uh, again, just something that, you know, these articles, that sometimes they're, uh, they match up with what we're doing in our day-to-day -day, uh, coding world, and, and I think this is a good example. So I want to take a look at my A21A1s historically, and then in the upcoming year, uh, take a look at that as well, because they may match up to some of the denials you're seeing, and, and yet at the same time, I think some of these articles give us pause to say, hey, I'll go ahead and fight that denial, because it makes sense, and these are not, you know, these are reliable journals. This is not something that, uh, you know, people are doing just to publish it, and they're trying to make a point, so... Um, take a look, and, and I think they'll be helpful going forward. Okay, next slide. Um, along those same lines, and again, a couple more articles here. Uh, the first one being, uh, and I'll call this, put it in a category of 
you know, uh, certain conditions change and how we treat those conditions change over time. And we all, we aren't always able to keep up. So I, I noticed that, uh, I was seeing cases in MSDRG 417 that were patients were having a lap cholecystectomy for gallstone pancreatitis. And I noticed that a lot of secondary diagnoses of acute pancreatitis, and I thought to myself, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, uh, that, you know, typically the acute condition is going to be our principal diagnosis. And I ran into this article here that talks about just how the changes to the way we diagnose acute pancreatitis, that it's better to have an early cholecystectomy cholecystectomy so that we don't have a readmission and we don't have more chronic pancreatitis. And so it makes perfect sense. But I think sometimes in our, our minds, we just go with what we see in the record. So the physician writes gallstone pancreatitis due to uh, you know, chronic cholecystitis. And for whatever reason, that chronic condition was assigned as the principal diagnosis. So uh, again, just one of those things where Look at some of this information, see how it, it, it matches up to what you're coding and how you understand what some of the more recent changes are and how we treat some of our conditions. Because AP really is a, a, a very expensive, uh, two pancreatitis is a very expensive uh, proposition when you look at overall across the country. Uh, the second uh, article here uh, is about it's an international article, but I selected it anyway because it's about complicated UTIs. And it struck me that we don't have a code for complicated UTIs, yet when you read this information and they give a great examples of, of what are complicated UTIs, well, they're uh, infections in, in you know, compromised patients. Uh, there's a whole long list of things. Transplant patients, they recur despite adequate treatment. We know about uh, 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 MDR uh uh, antibiotic uh, resistance, and so you know, why don't we have a code for complicated UTIs? Well, we don't, but it out those UTIs and their bacterial uh, uh, infectious codes from the B95 to B97 area, and also on the TCS side. Okay, we've got uh, some new drug infusions. If you Look at your uh, new technology reports every year from CMS. Uh, for example, we've got IV uh, to uh, define this very particular diagnosis, which we don't have a code for. Because what I want to do is in a few years is go to CMS and say, we need to make sure we've got a code for complicated UTI. And that, in fact, it's a major complication of comorbidity. It's not just another UTI. And I think, unfortunately, that's what happens. We kind of all get mixed together, and we don't end up where we want to be, which is saying this patient is much sicker than your average, average patient's, patient that's being treated with normal antibiotics for UTI. Amy? Well, I think it just, again, highlights the importance of being aware of what's out there, and then when you see published data, going back and looking at your own internal data and saying, does this ring true? Um, you know, when the when the issue of acute pancreatitis and cholecystectomies came up, of course, we started data mining some data and we found a lot of a lot of cases where there potentially could have been, you know, an auditor to come in and say, we disagree with the way this was coded. It's not clinically accurate, right? Um, and also, again, looking at, again, this one's not coding specific, but because we don't have a code for complicated UTI, we do see that they are longer hospital stays when we look at our data. It is a severe complication or comorbidity. And so it allows you to have actual information and data to present back to CMS during the open comment period. Um, so, you know, just again, being proactive, seeing what's out there and then seeing how it reconciles against your own um, facilities or clients' data. Okay, thanks, Amy. Uh, next slide and use case, uh, present on admission indicator and not present on admission. And again, you can call it, uh, I think in Europe, they call it a timestamp. Uh, again, very important that we, we look at what's happening with POA and NPOA. So in that critical care medicine article, which is a good one, it talks about sepsis and the cost of sepsis. 
And they looked at 2.5 million sepsis cases in this study, and 87.7% were present on admission, and 12% were NPOA. So uh, my question to you is, does that look like your data as well? Uh, do you audit for audit for sepsis as principal diagnosis without a secondary diagnosis of infection? Okay, think of that uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, ARC CCS infection category. I can get you some of those codes to look at. So, so really, uh, it, it's the kind of situation where, uh, and, and we won't go down the sepsis three road, and we don't have enough time. But uh, you know, how do you how do you know that uh, you're feeling good about that NDOA sepsis, and is it sequenced correctly? Is it is it coded correctly? And uh, did you really mean POA, or did you really mean NDOA? Uh, second article. Uh, looks at present on admission, this time for bloodstream infections. They were looking at healthcare associated infections among patients with a bloodstream infection present on admission. So I thought it was interesting that, you know, we, we tend to focus in the hack uh, PSI world of not present on admission. And here's a, a study that says, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, healthcare associated infections are associated with longer hospitalization based on patients having a bloodstream infection that's present on admission. So, so again, you know, a, a different take on what we're used to seeing in our, maybe in our, some of our day-to-day -day, uh, case discussions and presentations, but something I think equally important to say, uh, you know, as we move down the path of are we going to sepsis three, are you going to start looking at two SOFA scores, uh, you know, this should be helpful and that's where you, you've got to go back and really uh, take a look at your data. Amy? Yeah, I would just say that, um, again, with NLP and CAC and all the technology and all the alerts that are in the EMR host systems, you would expect that claims are not being coded where sepsis is the principal diagnosis and there is no other secondary diagnosis of infection. But in the data that when we've done data mining, it's happening a lot more than I would expect. And so if you don't already have safeguards in to prevent that, from reaching the payer and the bill actually dropping with those codes. Um, if you don't already have something to proactively stop it, you need to make sure that that's something that you're looking for because surprisingly, when you start looking at the data, it is happening a lot more than I think a lot of us would like to admit. Back to you, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we have a rainstorm here, so I didn't want you to hear the thunder and lightning. Uh, PCS. Okay, procedures. Uh, believe it or not, there are a few articles finally on PCS. I've been following it for a uh, few years now, and there weren't too many uh, at the start of our conversion, but now we're starting to see them. So on the first Journal of Thoracic Disease, they, they took it on head on and they said, well, we want to see uh, what PCS is all about and can it help us in, in looking at data. And they had a couple uh, positive things to say about it. And they also had some things that they thought were a bit confusing, ambiguities around, believe it or not, root operation, you know, and, and looking at lobectomies and whether they're excision versus resection. So again, something that may not matter from a payment perspective, but if you're a thoracic surgeon, you want that level of detail, and they weren't sure they're uh, going to get it consistently. So I think the more we start to look at strategies for auditing and getting better at PCS coding, interpreting it, looking at the data, uh, we need to look at articles like this. So, uh, for, for example, looking at uh, – they said there was no method of differentiating between video-assisted video versus robotic-assisted thoracic thoracoscopic surgery, well, that's a mouthful. Uh, and, and again, remember, we've got some PCS codes for robotic assisted. The question is, do we need better definition around that based on articles like this? And then their final comment had to do with, they didn't like the fact that there were no eponyms in PCS, which uh, I think surgeons would, would agree would be helpful. So anyway, take a look at that interesting article, maybe give you some ideas for looking at your uh, Characters in PCS for you know approach device qualifier root operation uh, for pulmonary circulation. <clears throat> uh, I thought this was just interesting because it was uh, 
combination codes in PCS. So we've got ultrasound assisted catheter directed thrombolysis, okay, for uh, anticoagulation versus treatment for uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. So again, you know, are, are you typically adding that ultrasound therapy code with the introduction of the thrombolytic uh, infusion? And, and those are the kinds of things that, you know, may not make a lot of sense because there's no payment implication, but uh, for someone that wants to look at this data without having to go diving into records, then this is this is where we want to be consistent and accurate in our uh, assignment of these PCS codes. Uh, next use case, uh, discharge disposition. Uh, I think this is always interesting because, again, we're back to our uniform bill. Uh, so the first article here talks about uh, of readmission among patients hospitalized with uh, community-acquired pneumonia. And in this study, they found that uh, of patients discharged home with home health care, 20% were readmitted compared to 11% discharged without services. Their conclusion was that home health care is a predictor of readmission for pneumonia patients. Now, that's interesting, and, and that's something that we can look at in our data because we've got discharge. We've got patient admit status and uh, point of origin. Uh, however, there's no point of origin code for admission from home health, right? Now, now that might be something interesting that we should be addressing with the folks at the uh, NUBC. Uh, and then the second article looked at uh, transfers between hospitals that do uh, uh, stroke uh, treatment uh, services. And, uh, you know, here I think it's, it's just a good example of, you know, consistency and accuracy. Are you able to make sure that if you are transferring patients to the tertiary care hospital that does endovascular capable stroke therapy, you know, are you consistently doing it? Is the transfer in hospital being identified? And it, you know, it doesn't sound important until you go back and you find that you have some errors, and uh, they can become payment errors. But also, in, in something like this, we want to make sure we're we're assigning our discharge disposition correctly and including it in our in our uh, audits. Sometimes I think they get left out because we're so focused on uh, diagnoses and procedures. Okay. No, I don't have anything to add on that one, Tom. Keep going. Okay, okay, I'll keep I'll keep moving. We're running short of time here. Uh, discover public data. I threw this in here because uh, I think it's important. In the state of California, they provide uh, annual files for code frequencies. Okay, so there's no PHI here. They're just counts of the number of principal diagnoses and secondary diagnoses. Same thing for procedures. Counts of all your principal procedures and secondary procedures. I think it's great. I think it's something that we can use. You can certainly do it within your own data. The only problem is we don't have it for national data. Uh, so on this call, this is your homework assignment. I want you to send an email to Allison Oschlager. I'll, I'll uh, send you that email later if you contact me. Uh, she's the Chief Data Officer and Director of Office of Enterprise Data and Analytics at CMS. And I sent her an email, and she very politely said, we have lots on our platter. Uh, but I think it would be good if every year we had a data table that had the code frequencies for all of our Medicare future service, and I'd actually like to see it for our Medicare Advantage as well, because we know what that means, even though it's just volume. But we can tell that maybe there's more volume in unspecified codes, or my, my volume in this particular PCS code doesn't look like the national codes. So again, take a look around. Maybe your state has some data. Uh, the second box there is for CMS, MSCRG summary tables. A lot of times people say, well, I don't have any comparative data for my hospital versus my neighboring hospital. And believe it or not, CMS does have uh, these tables by hospital. They're a little bit dated, but they do provide us with DRG information, uh, average Medicare payments, total payments, charges. So take a look. I think you'll... Uh, uh, be able to use that in your uh, projects. Uh, here we've got uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Again, I, I, if you've uh, seen these files before, 
uh, great. If not, uh, check them out. They're the clinical classification software for both diagnoses and procedures. And this is simply where the government uh, ARC people have rolled up all the codes into 200 plus categories for both diagnoses and procedures. And this is great because you don't have to go poking around for trying to combine codes to come up with something. So, for example, if I want to look at the adverse effects of medical drugs, like we were talking about before, there may be depression. There, there are 490 codes in their CCS category that they've already got assigned for you. So all you do is pick the category, use it in your query, and you're all set. Same thing for procedures. Uh, you know, you want to look at skin grafts, that's 191 CCS codes. So instead of trying to do it yourself, it's all done for you. Second point here is chronic condition indicators for ICD-10. That's called CCI. Real simple. They split our diagnosis codes between chronic and not chronic, one versus zero. I'm interested in seeing chronic codes because maybe I want to match those up with my CCs and my MCCs and my HCCs and my secondary diagnoses that have an SOI of two, three, or four, or my risk of mortality codes. So, again, all done for you, updated every year. Take a look. I think it's helpful. And finally, the last one here uh, is the clinical classification software and for services and procedures. And here, they, they really map uh, CPS 6 codes to some of their uh, CCS codes on the procedure side. So take a look. Very interesting. Something that maybe you can work on a project with where you're trying to figure out uh, what's my link between uh, CPT and PCS. And just for reference for everybody on the webinar, that was slide 14 that Tom just covered. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't have, a, I'm not actually on the viewing the slides as I present them, so uh, I'm looking at a different journal. Uh, okay, uh, denials management, Amy, you wanted to talk a little bit about this? Sure, just that hopefully, you know, from a denials management perspective, again, not just as you're getting denials, there's the response to denials, but then there's also proactively preventing. So hopefully we've given you some information of where to go and get some publicly available data, how to potentially look at outside clinical resources to re-examine your data how to potentially leverage, you know, looking at your own data and leveraging some data elements from the clinical record and cross-referencing those um, to hopefully, again, pre proactively prevent those denials from happening. If you know that United Healthcare is going to deny every sepsis case if their SOFA score is not X, then, you know, what are you doing from an operational perspective to make sure that that doesn't continue to be an issue? And then how that kind of, again, clinical validation is an important piece of denials management. So just really kind of looking at this as like a continuous process improvement feedback loop, right? Um, taking your denials data to then help you drill in on what you may need to do with clinical validation recognizing that clinical validation is more than just a consensus definition, but it's also looking at, you know, consistent outcomes and interreliability amongst your coding, CDI, and audit staff, and just really kind of trying to take a step back and look at the entire picture um, to have that, that continuous process improvement um, cycle. Um, and then using that, wow. again, yes, we're back. leveraging... Yeah, go ahead. And then leveraging technology to um, automate as much of that as possible. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, great point. I, I was going to say back to interreliability again, and, and, and really that's, that's key here. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next next slide. I uh, added a slide for HCCs here because there is, uh, there was some talk at the MedPAC meeting about uh, making sure that our Medicare Advantage uh, encounter, encounter data is getting better. And as I said before, it would be really nice if we could actually see some public data from that particular program, program because I forget how many millions of uh, Medicare patients are Medicare Advantage now. Uh, but again, looking at HCCs, and I know people are busy doing that now, uh, I, I want to create that continuum where I can see right across uh, the rows, just 
what's an HTC, what's an, what's an MCC, a CC, and, and go back to things that we thought about before, like what, what are our unspecified rates with some of these codes, okay, especially for some of those chronic conditions. Uh, you know, are you still looking at that metric? I'm, I remember years ago it started out as, you know, 31, 32% unspecified rate, and hopefully that's come down a bit. Is HCCs and you know make sure that uh, that it, that it's all making sense. But uh, you know right now we'll we'll see what happens and and we'll see if they'll eventually release some of that data. Medicare Advantage, <coughs> excuse me, versus HHS uh, FFS fee for service uh, codes. And okay, Dennis, next Tom's slide. Having uh, audio difficulties. In, um, yeah. Real quick, Tom, I just want to interject on the HCCs um, since since we're talking about it, yep. an important point. I know a lot of people have looked at the proposed rule and seen the changes to the CCs and the MCCs. And um, just a caution, if something's not a CC or an MCC anymore, it a lot of those changes that were CCs that are now nothing are still HCCs. So if you've got ACOs or, you know, you, you can't, you, we don't want the pendulum to swing too far where RAF scores start to go down for populations that you're trying to manage because the inpatient focus for CDI and coding has, has shifted away from certain chronic conditions that may no longer be a CC or MCC, but still are an HCC. So when you're looking at those CC and MCC analysis and looking at proposed, the proposed rule and how that might impact, also factor in, especially when you're talking about educational efforts with physicians and documentation integrity, make sure you're not losing sight of those HCCs, even in the inpatient environment. Great, a great point, Amy. And and really, we want to be able to make sure that we can compare last year to next year, and hopefully, your acute blood loss anemia will look kind of the same, right? Because probably won't change. Uh, okay, slide 17. Just quickly, we all know the uh, uh, OIG right now is probably looking at records that they're going to include in that. Uh, report expected in 2020 looking at hospital billing and possible upcoding. So just, again, we'll, we'll see how far behind they are. Typically, they're a few years behind in terms of uh, trends and issues that we know about. But just keep that in mind. I guess we'll expect a report, you know, sometime next year. Uh, slide 18, data.gov, just, again, some sources for data. If you're looking for uh, data sets, the government has uh, provided some that are, are are useful here. Okay, then we've got a few slides of supplemental material that just look at uh, NLP and billing data. There's some great things happening around combining what we code with NLP, as Amy mentioned before, talking with our, our NLP experts, and <clears throat> they're finding that it's really a very accurate way to, to get to information that previously we couldn't do just by code alone or just by looking at, at NLP. So I think it's we're uh, five two, so you better stop here. Take questions, Amy. I would just, um, I think Tom's and my contact information is, I, I think, on the slide deck. Um, Tom has a distribution list that people are lucky to be a part of. Um, he makes the people that are on that distribution list aware of some of these articles and things that he's found. He's a wealth of knowledge, and he readily shares that. Um, so reach out to him if you want to be on his distribution list. Um, and then if there's any questions that I can't specifically answer or go into more detail on, you can reach out to me um, with any questions as well. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And, uh, you know, hopefully we, we provided you with some information today that you can take back and work with. And if not, uh, please reach out and we'll see where we can go from here. Thank you both. Um, I think we have a couple minutes for a few questions, if that works. Um, we had one question. Um, if you have any thoughts or information on denial management for an ED facility, 
that's one I would probably take in a follow-up email. So Sarah Campos, um, you asked it. If you could send me an email with your contact information, I can get back to you. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, and then there was another question back, of, uh, way back, I think closer towards the beginning of the presentation, you talked about some issues related to sepsis and um, whether that's more common it just an inpatient or in a professional uh, fee thing as well. I think it would be common in both. Um, I would say if it, in some cases it may be more prevalent on the pro fee side um, because you know there's still a lot of there's still a lot of pro fee billing where it's happening where the physicians are selecting their own codes in the EMR and not understanding that if they select sepsis they also need to identify the you know infection etc. So I, I think it's prevalent in both realms, some probably even more so on the pro fee side, um, just because that's not always being done by a team of enterprise trained coders. Sometimes it's, it's being done by the physicians themselves through the EMR. Thank you, Amy. Um, I think that's it for questions. Um, Amy and Tom, thank you so much for presenting this to us and for sharing your contact information um, so folks can follow up with you directly if they have any any um, follow-up questions. Um, just want to oh, recap. Oh, oh God. Sorry, I did see one other question. Tom, the reference about the Rx classes, um, you said it was available on the internet. Um, what site is that available at? Yeah, I would just Google Rx math and uh, Rx classes. That's one word, Rx classes, Rx math. Uh, and, and you'll see there, the government sites will come up and they'll show you the, the classes. And if not, send me an email and I'll send you the link. Awesome. Thanks for catching that, Amy. No problem. Uh, so here is the information for obtaining your CEU certificate, but don't worry about jotting this down because I'll also be sending an email to everybody. Um, it'll go out first thing tomorrow morning and that email will contain this link. It will contain the slide deck. It will contain a link to the recording. Um, so if you know folks that weren't able to join today's presentation because we did max out on attendance, they can still um, view the recording and earn their CEU certificate. So um, here's the link to get your certificate. If you have any problems, feel free to email me, uh, cbyron at truecode.com. Um, and thanks everyone, we really appreciate your time. And thanks, Tommy. <laughs> thanks, Tom and Amy. <laughs> no problem, thank you Thank you. All. Bye, everyone. <laughs>